Hello, Daddy. Hello, Mom. I'm your ch 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 Jerry Bob. She'll come. She'll go. Silver. I don't actually know the lyrics. Um, okay, let's move on. We're actually not talking about David Bowie today, uh, although it may look as though we are. We're going to talk about the Runaways movie that came out in 2010. I was a 12-year-old girl when this movie was released, and it altered my brain chemistry. When I was doing research for this video, I kind of intended it to be a double hitter in terms of talking about not just the movie, but also the true story story of the runaways, kind of comparing what things really happened, what did they get right, what was a little bit off or cut for the movie. In that research, I almost decided not to do this video because the real story of the runaways is really hard to talk about and was really hard to read about. Ultimately, I, uh, I rewatched the movie for this and I am still obsessed with it. It's more of like a coming of age fun little sort of biopic. A lot of the individual scenes are pretty accurate to what at least the members of the band say really happened. I mean, it's the same as pretty much any biopic. You can expect uh, the creators to take some liberties to make it more entertaining. We're just going to have a good time with this movie because it, it really it did something to me. So getting into it, my credentials. Not only was I a big fan of this movie when it came out, I am also in a band and I am a girl. So my best friend, bandmate, and most beautiful person in the world, Morgan, both dressed up as Joan Jett and Cherie Curry for Halloween one year. We feel very inspired by the Runaways in a way that so many bands with women in them feel inspired by the Runaways. The impact that they have had on the music industry is very much felt even to this day. I would say in a lot of ways, even more because of this movie. I would have had no idea that the Runaways existed when I was a teenager if it weren't for this movie. I would have had no idea that David Bowie existed without this movie. My disclaimers, I'm not going to go in depth about the allegations against Kim Fowley that are not addressed in this movie. I'm going to link that article so that you can read into that on your own time when you're in a space that you feel like you can do that. My other disclaimer is that this movie is not only about teenage girls, it is also starring teenage girls. So the two big leads of this movie are Cherie Curry and Joan Jett and they were both 16-ish when the events took place and they're also played by at the time teenagers. Dakota Fanning was 16 and Kristen Stewart was 19 when this movie came out. I do not feel comfortable sexualizing them in this movie. The movie certainly does feel comfortable doing that because it's doing its best to be faithful to what really happened and they were extremely sexualized at the time or at least Cherie Curry was and I don't have a problem necessarily with portraying those events because it is faithful to what really happened but they really didn't need Dakota Fanning to play Cherie Curry. They could have gone with an adult. Lots of movies and TV shows do that. I know that it gets a lot of criticisms when the actor is much older than the character that they're portraying, but there is some good reasons for that. I don't want to see a teenager in a corset, you know. You know what? I should have gotten a mirror to make sure that I was still looking cute. <laughs> I just looked at myself. I look good like this. First of all, I look cool as hell. <laughs> I feel like this is what I've always meant to look like. Good work. Good work, me. <laughs> so let's get into the events of the movie. Cherie gets her first period and we basically are just learning more information about the relationship between her and her sister. This movie was apparently based off of Cherie Curry's autobiography. So it includes a pretty important storyline of her and her family. Her twin sister, Marie, was the more popular, more beautiful twin. Her and her twin do end up having a music career together later on. And you can see the seeds of that kind of being planted during this movie. Next up, we meet Joan Jett. Joan Jett is an icon and Kristen Stewart is, she means a lot. 
to me. She really does. <laughs> she is shopping for clothes and she dumps a bunch of change on the counter and points to the guy at the counter with her and is like, I want what he's wearing. I like this scene because it really speaks to Joan's impact as a fashion icon. She didn't ever play punk music, but was really into the punk scene and had a pretty big impact on punk fashion. Then we go back to Cherie and we see her getting ready for her school's talent show. This is the first scene that altered my brain chemistry. I, I wanted to be her. I wanted to be her bad. If you are a closeted bisexual weirdo and you discover David Bowie, it's it is basically like meeting your hero. <laughs> he, yeah, a big moment for me, okay? And I I had always, always, always wanted to imitate this exact makeup look and perform Lady Gritting Soul. If I ever do drag, that's what I'm gonna do. I love that song. I love David Bowie. And this is really true for Cherie as well. She talks about how she was really inspired by David Bowie. They also say that like a lot of the members of the Runaways were just sort of imitating their idols. Joan Jett was a huge Susie Quattro fan. Lita Ford was uh, basically imitating Jimi Hendrix. Sandy the drummer was apparently a really big Queen fan. And Jackie Fox was a big Gene Simmons fan. Another thing I wanna talk about is Cherie Curry's more recent tweets about her obsession with David Bowie and using that as a way to be incredibly transphobic. She has gotten onto this sort of moral panic train of people being afraid of children getting gender affirming care. Basically, Cherie Curry was saying that when she was a teenager, she was obsessed with David Bowie and wanted to be him, wanted to be like him. If she were a teenager now, then she would be given hormones to medically transition when in reality she was just wanting to be like David Bowie, which just is a fundamental misunderstanding of what being trans actually is. I think it is important to make a distinction between playing with your gender expression versus having actual gender dysphoria. But I don't feel like arguing with people like this because it just just sort of feels like arguing with a wall. One thing Sheree has said is that back in the 70s, they would have never done this, that being trans like didn't exist back then, or she implies that it didn't exist or that children were not transitioning back then. And I just also wanted to add that that's just not true either. If you follow Marty Pants on TikTok or other social media, who I will also link in the bio, uh, she talks a lot about her experience of being trans in the 70s and a teenager as well, for that matter. Then we get to see Joan Jett have a music lesson. So she is learning on top of Old Smokey on her unplugged electric guitar and the person teaching her is like, Girls don't play electric guitars. Joan gives her own little rendition. All covered with snow I dump my poor sweetheart for screwing too slow when Joan was a child, her parents told her that she could be anything. And she says that she believed them. So when she asked for an electric guitar for Christmas, when she was 13, they gave her one. She ex explains that this experience was pretty accurate. Excuse me, I don't think you want to do that right now. So then Joan meets Kim Fowley. Kim Fowley is a famous producer who basically put the runaways together. So this movie takes place in the 70s and Kim Fowley in some interviews, the real Kim Fowley, has talked about reasons why the runaways were so successful, why he knew that they would be successful. The fact that a lot of rock stars and men of the time, like David Bowie, Mick Jagger, were being more feminine. It only made sense that the next level of that was going to be actual women. He introduced introduces her to Sandy West. Sandy West is another sort of tragic figure in this story. Joan Jett says that she was one of the greatest people of all time, one of the best drummers of all time, never got credit for it. In the 2004 documentary called Edge Play about the Runaways, you can tell that Sandy feels really hurt by the fact that the Runaways did not stay together for longer, did not reach the level of success that she felt like they all deserved. Sandy died really tragically in 2006, very young um, due to lung cancer. From my understanding, she was just like a good vibes person. 
she is not an important character in the story she is kind of sidelined because of the way that the movie really focuses on Joan and Cherie it's kind of their movie their biopic based off of the clips I've seen of Sandy and the way that people have talked about Sandy I like the way that she's portrayed I think um, it makes sense for her even though she doesn't get a ton of screen time after Joan and Sandy start making some music together they go back to this club to try and find their Bridget Bardot blonde bombshell singer. Basically, Kim goes up to Cherie and he's like, I like your look. Do you play an instrument? Do you sing? Whatever. And Cherie's like, yeah, I sing a little bit. He invites her to audition for The Runaways and tells her to learn a Susie Quattro song. Cherie Curry says that she really did show up to the audition to sing the song Fever, which is a Peggy Lee song that Susie Quattro covered. The band is like, uh, okay, like this isn't really rock and roll. <laughs> So why did you choose this song? This is also the scene where we get to meet Lita Ford's character played by Scout Taylor Compton. Okay, guys, I had a weird random obsession with Scout Taylor Compton when I was a teenager. She was in the Halloween remakes that Rob Zombie made. Looking back on it, it might have been a more of um, a romantic feeling towards her that maybe I wasn't aware of at the time. Her portrayal of Lita Ford is, she's just a bitch. <laughs> She's just a huge B-I-C-T-H. And I kind of love it. They don't really do her character justice. They don't really talk about Lita Ford that much. And she ends up having a really successful career after The Runaways. I mean, she is a metal queen. Scout Taylor Compton's performance is like comedically mean. I don't think it's super far off from Lita's actual character at the time, especially watching that documentary. The way that she talks about the other people in the band, especially the way she talks about Jackie, is is really hard to see and, to, and to, to watch. And that's obviously in 2004. I mean, I don't. she might be a better person now. She might have a different perspective on the whole thing now. She really didn't get abused as much by Kim Fowley because of her attitude. If you are in a band where you see your bandmates getting treated horribly and abused constantly by this adult man taking advantage of you and you learn that if you have a big enough attitude that he will leave you alone, I'm okay with her being a bitch in this movie. Learning that a woman that I look up to is actually really mean in real life is never going to deter me from still loving her. And that's really brave of me. It actually makes me like a feminist. We get some really fun coming of age moments. The girls are girling. We see them on the hill of the Hollywood sign. I learned in the Joan Jett documentary that they were arrested at Disneyland for holding hands. People were like, lesbian! And then they um, brought him to jail. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't want to be in it. Come here. Thank you. Oh, big guy. You want to be in this? I love you too. Good boy. So Kim Fowley puts these women into heckler boot camp, essentially. They are practicing and he gets these random dudes to throw a bunch of cans and literal dog shit at them. This really did happen. When they do go out on the road, they are actually treated this way. At first, it felt like the runaways was just like, oh, look cute, like cute little girls playing rock music or whatever. But then when they got serious about it, it made people actually really angry. What do you mean women can do what men do? That's not allowed. I'm gonna throw a beer can at you. So this is also when we are introduced to Robin Robbins. They might as well just call her Jane Doe. <laughs> Jackie Fox declined to be a part of the movie because when she was offered to use her name, they would not send her a copy of the script. They just created this fictional character to play the role of the bassist. Kim Fowley calls her a brainy brainiac who's rolling thunder on the bass. Jackie Fox loved to read. She was more girly than the other girls, according to Lita. I am a girl's girl. Lita thinks that she's somehow better than Jackie because Jackie liked having her nails be done. She at one point even says in the documentary that that is the reason why Jackie quit the band, which is an insane thing to say if you do your research and learn more about what happened to her. It just attests to the fact that like this is not the complete story. At the time, Jackie was not ready to come forward with all of what really happened to her in the band. When they're on tour, we are introduced to the second moment that altered my brain chemistry as a teenager 
character, Joan Jett, takes this little green squirt gun and she has a bottle that she stole from Cherie's dad of vodka and pours it into the squirt gun, squirts it in the air and catches it with her mouth and then squirts it into Cherie Curry's mouth. Okay, so let me just say, it, it doesn't end well for the people using substances, misusing substances in this film. Let me make that clear. However, Kristen Stewart is, I'm just gonna move on. Then we get into Dead End Justice. This song freaking rules. I love this song. Dakota and Kristen are really doing their best. Me and my best friend, bandmate, most beautiful person in the world, Morgan, have also done our best to <laughs> cover this song. We're entering into yet again another moment that has altered my brain chemistry. The song I Want to Be Your Dog by the Stooges plays. They've just performed. Joan Jett has a cigarette. She takes a drag, leans over to Cherie Curry, blows the cigarette smoke in her mouth. And then they make out. <laughs> Just know that, um, you know, I understand that most people are born gay. <laughs> Hang on. Hang on. Before I finish that sentence, <laughs> let me take a deep breath. I, I think Kristen Stewart actually, um, she had a part. So the ladies are about to head out to play at the Japanese Music Festival. A lot of the women will talk about how Kim Fowley really manipulated them into hating each other. He sends some photographers over to Cherie's house to take some photos of her. And she's like, what about the rest of the band? He's like, don't worry about it. She does a photo shoot of her in her underwear and her corset. This goes on the cover of a Japanese magazine and the band really hates that. And this is pretty accurate to what really happened as well. We also get an incredible Kristen Stewart moment. Cherie is trying on the infamous corset that she wore while performing Cherry Bomb in Japan. Joan Jett's like, what the hell are you wearing? I'm thinking with my cock. And Kristen Stewart goes, You're more like boner. It is corny. But I love her. I love her so much. I really do. And we see them perform Cherry Bomb. Dakota Fanning is performing it and enunciating. You can really tell that homegirl grew up as an actress. She is pronouncing every syllable. We can't all do it the way that Cherie did because she really did something with that song. <laughs> we start to see the band's drug use really catch up to them in particular for Cherie. So then we get to the band's breakup. So they are cutting another record. It's set up in a way to be a little more convenient for the narrative. The reasons for breaking up are not that far off. According to Cherie, she showed up for recording on time and apparently the band showed up two hours late. According to Lita, the opposite was true. That is sort of the catalyst for her leaving. Lita blew, blew up on her because she was like, my twin needs a car. My family's more important than this band. And Lita was like, you need the band to be more important than your family. And Cherie was like, well then, bye. She was also just really done at that point anyway. Cherie goes to rehab. We skip two whole Runaways albums with Joan as the lead singer. Basically just go right to Joan's solo career. Then we get to see Dakota Fanning get to take the wig off to symbolize the fact that she is better now. <laughs> Joan Jett is on the radio and Cherie Curry calls in to speak to her. I doubt that this really happened. They're just sort of trying to have like a neat little tie up for the narrative. In general, none of the band members really make it to the same level of success as Joan. It is a little funny that they chose Cherie to really focus on, despite the fact that Lita Ford, again, has a pretty successful music career after The Runaways as well. Maybe it was just a more compelling story. Maybe they had more source material to work on for the script. I think part of the reason is that Joan hates Lita Ford. <laughs> we end on the song Crimson and Clover, which is my favorite Joan Jett song. So Kim Fowley does die after this movie was released basically of old age in the 2004 documentary Cherie Curry still hates this man and I think he deserves that in more recent interviews she talks about how she ends up 
forgiving Kim Fowley and was kind of part of his end of life care. Jackie Fox, on the other hand, she says what she really wanted was to speak to his face and tell him that he was not forgiven. She wanted him to die knowing that. I really wish that she had gotten that because he's despicable. My end conclusions. Biopics are only going to be as accurate as the memory of the person who is most involved. And in this case, we've got Joan Jett's hero origin story. It's an entertaining movie, but it is at the end of the day, still a movie, not a documentary. My next conclusion, um, smoking bad, drugs bad, don't romanticize them, no matter how cool those scenes might be. And then finally, Kristen Stewart is really hot. Yeah, that's my that's my truth. And Joan Jett is an icon. Speaking to the whole trans issue with, with Cherie Curry, Joan Jett was really supportive of Laura Jane Grace, the lead singer of Against Me, who came out as trans in 2012. There's this really great performance of Joan and Laura and Miley Cyrus. But, you know, I don't like the way that Joan handles some of the more problematic aspects of the Runaways legacy. She denies having any part of the sexual assault allegations, despite the fact that multiple witnesses can attest to the fact that she was there. Jackie Fox literally gives Joan and Cherie an opportunity to confess to the fact that they were there. She says that she understands the bystander effect and understands that they were teenagers and, you know, didn't have the resources that they needed to be able to deal with that. And it made sense that they would have done something about it in the moment. I mean, they were all being abused by this man. People are complicated. We can still acknowledge the positive impact that they may have had. Like this movie is a complicated one with a complicated history that still had a really positive impact on me personally. I love this movie. I love this band. I think it's a good watch. I recommend it. Thank you for watching, guys. If you liked this, maybe you'll like my other videos. Um, I've done a few now. I'm enjoying it. This video is sponsored by Burly Girlies. We have a video release of us performing some songs. One of the songs, 14, is about my own experience with grooming. If you want to check that out, if you were interested in topics surrounding that issue, you might like that song. I'll see you in the next one, okay? Bye.